Well, good morning, everybody. Church from the car, once again. So appreciate you um, just being a part of what a live church is at this stage and what God has continued to do through each and every one of us. And so I think, you know, just thanking you for that. I don't thank you lightly because I know that, um, you know, we're, we're doing something that's maybe different than obviously what we've all been used to. And I know I mention that every once in a while, but I just really truly have a grateful heart for each and every one of you who have um, been so faithful and sticking to uh, this season of church as it is and um, kind of blends in with the message I want to share today. We've been on our uh, courage sec, uh, series, but want to do another C and that's contentment. Contentment, being content with uh, what God has put in your life and what's in your hand at the moment and what is before you at the current time. And so wanted to uh, just dive into the message here after a, a short prayer. So I'm going to pray and then dive into <clears throat> Luke 12, 13 through 21. If you want to go ahead and get there in your Bibles. Uh, Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that you are more than enough for us and you provide for us so well. We thank you, God, for your spirit that is alive and well in us. And through your spirit, we have the ability and the empowerment to be all that you've called us to be. Without you, God, without your spirit, we can do nothing that you want us to do. But we pray that you would be glorified today as we gather together on this wonderful Father's Day. And we just thank you for this wonderful time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A happy Father's Day to all you dads, fathers, granddads, uh, maybe spiritual fathers, maybe um, maybe not even biological fathers, but maybe you fathered people uh, throughout your life. And so I want to say a happy Father's Day to you all. It is a privilege and an honor to be a dad myself. And I know um, at times the challenges can be overwhelming, but it, but most often it is so rewarding just to um, be able to be a dad and be able to raise kids and know that you're doing the best you can to raise them in a godly way and that God is covering their lives. And so happy Father's Day. Hope you enjoy the day. If, um, if you do, uh, or if you can, if you have a Bible in front of you, Luke 12, 13 through 21 is what I'm going to read today. <coughs> and we're talking, excuse me, about contentment. Contentment. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he, being Jesus, he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You could highlight that one if you'd like. That speaks to all of us, I think. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. A very telling scripture, I think, for all of us that most often I think we want to have all that we need and we want to have everything that that we desire and require to live this life. And... Many times it can be like, hey, I just I just want to take it easy. I'm just going to take care of my needs. I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of. And But this scripture is, is, is talking about being content with what you have 
And instead of this man maybe tearing down his barns and building bigger barns and just just keeping more and more and more for him, it has this thought that maybe you should have done something for someone else, especially being rich towards God. Maybe you should have been okay with the barns that you had, fill them up to the brim, and then with that leftover, um, well, really what he should have done is gave God his tenth, then filled his bar- barns up to the brim, and if he had leftover, sow it into the kingdom of God, help the poor, reach out to the needy, do those things beyond himself. But this man was very focused on how he could just kick back, eat, drink, and be merry, but God told him otherwise. And obviously this man's struggle um, with his brother was that he was worried, he was frustrated, he was striving, and he wanted his full share of what was coming to him. This man's struggle suggested to Jesus that he was a covetous person and that money and things were most important to him. We know this because Jesus then warned him and said, take heed and beware of covetousness. So Jesus made it pretty plain what this man's struggle was that came to him and said, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. But Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then Jesus told him a parable about this man who had plenty that came through his his fields produced plentifully. And then the man stopped and thought he had all he needed when really in this world, the world can't like the natural world cannot provide all we need. We need a connection to God. So Jesus told him a parable, reminded him, showed him what he looked like, that he was wanting things to try to make life easier, but really God is the one who's in control fully of our lives. And we have to be careful because it can slip into our life sometimes, this this attitude of covetousness. Like if I only had that, man, I could take it easier. If I only had that, I could take this many days off vacation, or if I only had that job, I would have enough money, or if I only had this, and and there's nothing wrong with setting goals and, and having um, certain certain level of living, but then when you get beyond what you need, and you're just, the, 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 the requirement is I just need more, 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 then you hit a point where you need to stop and think about, how much more do I really need? Like, I, I, I have this, I have that, my family is this, and we're set. And we're on track to save for the future and save for the things that come up. But then beyond that, we, we can be generous, we can be givers. Covetousness is something that we are told will characterize the days leading up to the coming of the Lord. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 2 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And I think we see more and more as, as time goes on that, that people are becoming more one self-centered, more proud, boasting in in who they are and and what they do, blasphemers of the word, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, and lovers of money. We got to be careful not to let those things slip into our life as believers because all of those things will pass away. Money will pass away. The things we boast about won't mean anything in a a few days, in a, in a few years, but if not even in a few days, the, the pride that we have in, in what we've accomplished will mean nothing at some point. And those who blaspheme the word that 
Their word means nothing because the word of God holds true. Being disobedient to parents and unthankful and unholy, all these things can slip into the way we operate our life. And we have to be careful to be different than the world. We can't live that kind of life and think that we're going to be content. But if we decide, hey, I'm going to be generous and hey, I'm going to use what I have to minister to people, minister to the poor and minister to those who don't have enough, then we're getting in line to a life of contentment. We can't live a life that's generous and that's selfless without contentment. If we are not content, we're going to constantly be thinking about what we need, what we want to achieve. And again, achieving things and goals is not the problem. It's it's the full focus of All I need is this. All I need is that. I'm going to drive, 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 and this is my life. No one else matters. And, and, you know, I, I, I assume that none of us live that way, but we may have hints of discontentment. We may have moments of discontentment. We may have seasons of discontentment that we have to realize, you know what, with God, with what he's given me, how he takes care of me, And if I get more wise on on how to manage what he's given me, then I can be content. Personal contentment positions us to be good stewards, to be more generous, and to minister to the poor. In Philippians 4, uh, 4, 10 through 13, Paul was in prison in Rome. And this church called the Church at Philippi, even though they had financial struggles themselves, had sent money to Paul to assist him in Rome. Paul was very grateful for the gift because he was in a difficult place where he could not work. And he thanked them in this verse that I'm going to read, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Many times we we can tend to use that verse probably out of context a lot of times. Like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Paul's talking about he can do all things whether, whether he has enough or whether he has little. But in any situation, through Christ, he can do what Christ, he's called him to do in, in any of those scenarios. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. How many of us would be content with just food and clothing? Oh, we also need shelter. You know, we obviously there's things we do need. But God takes care of us. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Perdition simply means eternal punishment. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many arrows. Verse 9 begins with, but those who desire to be rich. Other translations kind of put it this way, but people who long to be rich or those who crave to be rich. Paul's statement there in verse 10 has often been misquoted as well. 
as money is the root of all evil. That is not the quote. It actually says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So people take this out of context. Oh, money's the root of all evil. No, but it's actually the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the the what it's speaking to is when riches are your goal rather than the will and purpose of God. It will lead you to make many bad decisions. Bad decisions in your ethics, in your priorities, in your use of time, and in your ministry and in what God has given you to do. You know, we see, of course, you know, you see the headline stories when, when you know, ministries or or ministers or pastors have issues with greediness or with lust or, or they fall morally. We see the headlines and we think, man, how sad for them. But we would be wise to make sure that our heart is in check, that we would not end up in similar situations. Maybe not as extreme, but maybe in, in certain areas of our life that we still haven't fully opened up to others about or we haven't fully opened up to the Lord about. And we could be quick to to judge and, and to point, you know, at someone who has a public failure. But I think we should be cautious in our own heart to not let even a hint, is what the word says, of lust or not even a hint of covetousness, not even a hint of these things. And in that brings us to the Lord in prayer every single day, if not several times a day, to say, Lord, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse cleanse what I'm thinking about and, and what I desire. What am I coveting today? What am I what am I looking at beyond what your purpose and your call in my life is that I think will bring me some sort of pleasure, joy, or happiness along the way that that actually I don't need and I can be content in what you've given me. When riches are our goal rather than the will and purpose of God, it will lead you to make bad decisions flat out. Many people today make, they, they move their family, they make career choices, they determine their job loyalty on the basis of the amount of money that they will receive for their efforts, which again, you should be making more as your career progresses. But we need to remember that that wealth, income, riches are only a tool rather than a goal. We want to be positioned to minister to others and to continue to be generous and to not just have this goal of more, more, more. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may hold on to eternal life. We can get caught up in in building up this life here on earth, but we need to keep our eyes focused on building the life to come, sowing into the kingdom of God. Not just storing up for ourselves here on earth, but storing for ourselves a good foundation for the time to come that we may lay hold of eternal life. I want to end today with some helpful definitions of contentment and then a few things what contentment is not. Contentment is the opposite of envy, covetousness, worry, ambition, and striving. How many times have you envied, been covetousness um, about maybe something someone else has or, or, or finances they have? How many times have you been worried about your own finances or tried to stir up ambition to get more finances or striving to get something that isn't quite yours yet. 
Contentment is a rest of mind. It's satisfaction, freedom from worry, and being at ease in one's situation. When was the last time you were free from worry about finances or the situation you're in and just able to, to in a sense, have your mind at rest and be satisfied with, with what God has given you? Contentment implies appeasement to the point where one is not disquitted or disturbed by a desire for what one does not have even though every wish is not fully gratified. So it's okay to say, yeah, there's, there's things in my life that I still, you know, would, would hope for, but I'm not disquitted or disturbed by what I don't have yet. I'm not, I'm not so focused on that. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the moment and I'm enjoying what I have now and being wise with what I have now so that maybe the future... I, I'm not going to be so worried. Contentment is limiting one's desires to what one has. It's not always wanting the next best thing. I mean, th- this is our culture with phones and tablets and everything. Is like when the next one comes out in, that, in a year and a half from now, even though my contract's not up, I, I want that. I want that next feature. I want that next phone. I want that next tablet. I want that next... Uh, accessory for the tablet. I want this in, in our culture just builds and built every year. There's something new or every six months, there's something new that you feel like you should have to be on top of your game. But contentment is limiting, limiting one's desires to what you have. Be okay with the phone you have. Be okay with the laptop you have. Be okay with the tablet you have. Be okay with the gaming system you have. Be okay with the car you have. Be okay with the things that you have. And don't always desire the next best thing. Contentment is maintaining a spirit of peace and a quiet confidence in all circumstances. Whether you're abounding in much or abased in little, you have a spirit of peace and a quiet confidence that you are not the things you possess. But you are a child of God. You are his son or daughter. You are a prince, a princess in the kingdom of God. You have access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Doesn't mean you're going to have everything this earth has to offer. But you have him. And so you can be quietly confident in all circumstances. Contentment is accepting God's plan for your life. You may look over to other people and say, wow, God really set them up on a pedestal or God really gave them what I wish I had. That calling looks better than the one I have. Your calling is designed for you. No one else can fulfill it except the plan God has for your life and walk in it confidently. Contentment is realizing that God has provided everything I need for my present happiness. For this present moment, you can find joy. You can find peace. You can find... Now, God God doesn't like... His goal is not that we're happy all the time. Let's get that straight. But contentment is realizing that God's provided everything for you to be happy with what you have. It's important after looking at all those things to, to just look at what contentment is not. Because I don't want us to get confused and then be aimless or ambitionless or goalless in our life. Being content does not mean having no goals or low goals. Like setting the bar pretty low. Because oh, I'm just content with where I'm at. Or you can have goals. You can have high goals. But you're content with the journey as you're, as you're practicing to get there. You're not trying to speed ahead. You're not trying to like waste your life on on just these goals you're 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 balancing time with the lord with with your family you're you're busy but you're you're moving forward at a pace that is sustainable being content does not mean that we lower our expectations we shouldn't be like well 
God's given me what I have. I shouldn't expect him to give me any more. No, he wants to bless you. He wants to pour out on you. The, the balance of contentment is just being okay with the step that you're in. It's like if there's a staircase that has a hundred steps on it, you're not always thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to the top. Can't wait to get to the top and missing all the good views and things that you have at stair five or at stair 10 or at stair 20. And you just keep moving up little by little, process on process, precept upon precept, but you're happy with the step that you're at. Contentment is not having no ambition in life. It doesn't mean you you just kind of put your head in the sand and and stay where you're at forever. No, you can move forward. You can step forward into maybe new promotions and new things and you know prayerfully put them before the Lord and make sure it's the will of God for your life and 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 talk to others around you to to get wisdom, but it doesn't mean no ambition. And contentment doesn't mean that we do not strive for excellence and influence and promotion, but we do it with a healthy version of striving. Like the Bible does say we should strive towards the goal of the upward call. It says we should, those who strive, um, you know, it's, it's not a sin. It doesn't say it's a sin to strive, but we need to have a proper view of striving. We don't just strive to keep up with the Joneses, or we don't just strive to, you know, get the next best thing. We we strive to serve the Lord in excellence, and He promotes us when we're serving in excellence, we're working in excellence. He gives us influence when the time is right. We're not just building it ourselves. Contentment doesn't mean that we do not seek to improve in all the areas of our life. So we're not just like, well, can't lose weight anymore, can't save money anymore, just you know, just don't have the drive for that. I guess I'm content with being what I am. No, we, we seek to improve in the areas that we do need to see improvement in so that we can be better content because we're not so worried about what we're gonna wear or how people are gonna think of us or what finances we have built up. I'll end with with this thought here. Contentment includes the concept of a limited lifestyle for the sake of ministry and purpose fulfillment. Contentment is a purposeful limitation that we place on ourselves. It means being satisfied with less when it comes to lavishing on ourselves so that we can direct more resources to ministry and the improvement of others. So it's saying, you know what? I could go do that for myself. And that would be probably a little bit much. So let me do that for someone else or pour into the kingdom of God more than I more than I maybe normally do. Come on, we have opportunities to pour into what God is doing on this earth and to also pour into others. And if we're not living in contentment, we'll miss those opportunities when they come because we'll think, oh, but what about this thing I have planned or that or that or this or I need this or I need more. I mean, you just think about like the last 10 years of of your life maybe. How often have you bought a new phone in 10 years that is close to like seven, eight, nine, a thousand dollars. And you think over 10 years, that's like, could be up to $10,000 if every year you're buying a new phone. And you stop and think and say, hey, could I, could I keep this same phone for say three, maybe even five years? I know people have kept their phones even longer. Yeah, they don't maybe stay updated as well, but it gets the job done, connects to the internet, gives you maps. You know, you might not have the latest technology, but if you bought two phones within a 10-year period, you would have a surplus of $8,000, say, if every phone was about $1,000. I know that's maybe on the high side, but just for the sake of numbers, if every phone 
the last 10 years, if you bought a phone for every year, was $1,000. That'd be $10,000. If you just got two phones within, you know, so let's say three phones because every 3.3 years you got a new phone. That saves you $7,000. What could you do with that $7,000? You could save it for generations to come. You could save it for the future, for what maybe God has in store for you. I'm just giving you ideas. The phone is just a, a an analogy. But we think about if we kind of looked at our entire life, like what do I put my my money into the most? Is it the kingdom of God? Is it serving others? Or is it technology? Is it getting more things for myself? Is it my needs, which obviously you got to take care of your needs and your family's needs. You got to do that. But beyond that, we need to just take take a scan of, of where we're at and see where we might be able to make some adjustments and be content with where we're at. Let me pray for us and then we'll have a time of, of receiving our tithes and offerings and then we'll close for today. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that draws us in and leads us towards the right path of life. And God, on that path is contentment. On that path is desiring your purpose and your will for our life and being able to decipher between um, what is too much and, and what is the needs and, and the, the things you want us to enjoy. God, I pray you'd give us wisdom to know the limits, to know how to put limitations on our life, not so that we don't enjoy anything ever, but that we could enjoy actual contentment and not be always worried about what I need next or how, how, how much do I need saved here or that or this or that. But God, we would be those that truly find contentment, whether we have much or we have little or we have medium, whatever it may look like right now. God, and I just pray right now that you would just impart to us a, a, a peace that passes all understanding, a contentment and an understanding that you will provide our needs. That doesn't mean that we don't put effort forth. It doesn't mean we don't have goals and, and, and somewhat of ambitions, but they're not just our ambitions. They're godly ambitions. They're ambitions to say, hey, I want to I wanna see this money used towards the purposes of God. I want to see this money given away to, to the poor or, or to the needy or to, to, to see a ministry funded. I want to do more outside of myself than I've done in the past. And so God, I pray that we would all be those kind of generous, content, cheerful givers. And God, take care of all of our needs. Give us the amount that we need to to live this life, to provide for our families, to enjoy what you've given us. But then let us know where the limit is so that we don't overindulge in this life and forget about setting up an eternal destiny You've set up our eternal destiny, but setting our heart towards that eternal destiny to sow into that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, God bless you. Just want to take a moment to receive our tithes and offerings. If it's been a while since you've given, I just encourage you to start stirring up that that generosity again. You know, the way we get generous and stay generous and, and get contentment and stay contentment, I think, starts with putting God first in our life. And that putting God first in our life, I think many times is tied to our heart, which our heart is tied to our treasure, the Bible says. And so when we begin to put our finances into what God is doing, and so sowing that into his kingdom by tithing, by giving that 10% of our income, then we're giving really, we're laying our heart before the Lord. We're laying um, everything that we own is represented in that 10%. And so we can give that confidently knowing that one, we're being generous and that we're, we're showing contentment. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to live off the 90 Lord, or, or if you want me to give more, I'll live off the 80 or the 70 or whatever it is you want me to give God, I will do that. And I'll live contently on the rest And so I just encourage you today, if it's been a while since you've given or you've just kind of lost heart and kind of doing it out of the motion, be encouraged that 
God is honored when we give cheerfully. And so we give today unto him. And so you can give today at alivechurchnyc.com slash give. And that's the easiest way for you to give online. Uh, or you can also mail in a, an, a tithe, an offering, a donation, um, whatever you prefer. You could reach out to us um, through the description below. You can see how to contact us. See, you can contact us at our website. Um, and then you can um, get our address. We'll give you our address and you can send it in that way. But the easiest way is at alivechurchnyc.com slash give. And uh, we, we just encourage you to put the Lord first in all you do in that way. Also, you can follow us on our social media platforms. They're right down, down there in the description below. And uh, without anything else from me, have a happy Father's Day, a great rest of your Sunday, and uh, we will see you next Sunday.